dear students here we are going to discuss a very important chapter from english grammar and probably this chapter is uh, not much discussed in english uh, learning but believe me this chapter is really very much essential for your learning of english grammar and the chapter is mood and here we'd have a very detailed discussion of mood so keep stayed glued to this uh, presentation and obviously you are going to learn something very much essential now if we say what is mood this is closely associated to tense and verb but uh, most of the time we learn tense with much importance but not mood so much essentially but believe me mood is such a chapter that here you would have to get very deep to learn the proper essence of the tense and the use of verbs in english grammar they are very much very much essential so let's start our discussion on mood and get what we get from here from this particular discussion so what is mood the definition what's the definition of mood look most of the time we take a word by its diction meaning that we get from the dictionary so mood it is uh, most of the time we consider as a uh, our mood that is uh, you may say uh, i am not in a good mood i am in a very bad mood but that mood is not what we are going to discuss here the mood of the verbs refers to whether or not something is a fact the intention of the speaker or the writer is understood by the mood of the verbs so here the fact yes i would ask you to put your focus on the word a uh, fact so verb refers something about a fact so the intention of the speaker or writer that is reflected through the verbs and this is called mood so if we go into detail so what is grammatical mood grammatical mood also known as mode refers to the quality or form of a verb in a sentence more specifically mood denotes the tone of a verb in a sentence so the intention of the writer or speaker is clear so from here we would understand when we follow the mood we would understand the quality or form of a verb in a sentence and more than that what is very much essential that we would get a reflection of the quality of the verb and also the intention of the writer or speaker and this intention would get clear and from there we could very easily detect what is reflected through this sentence so let's check it out in english grammar moods are are basically mainly of three different kinds and what are they the first of them is indicative mood and then comes the imperative mood and the third one is subjunctive mood and subjunctive mood this is something that you must learn very keenly obviously you need to learn imperative mood and indicative mood as well but subjunctive mood is very special so how is it special each of the types has a particular function there comes the speciality and you need learn the function of each and every mood so let's check it out first of them is indicative mood and in indicative mood what we get it tells the reader or the listener something factual this mood is generally used in making a statement or asking for a statement by a question so the statement can be factual or presumed to be factual now if we come into detail about indicative mood if we explain this here the reflection would be arrested by the reader or the listener 
and it is created by the speaker. So this is also a relationship between the speaker and the reader or the listener. And what we get from indicative mood, we get something factual. So factual means from here, a statement is produced through this sentence and the verb here function, it gets a function of stating something or narrating something. And also the verb is here expected to ask a statement with a question. So if you shift to the types of sentences, Yes, this is a very important fact that you must understand from there. That mood also speaks the types of sentences. So from indicative mood, we get either assertive or interrogative. And the factual, something factual, we have stated here now. Fact, what is the fact? Here we must remember that the statement can be fact. It can be a perfect fact. There is no doubt. And also, it can be a fact that is presumed. So, we presume this to be a fact. It might not be a fact in actuality, but the speaker presumes it as a fact. So, how it is? Uh, have some example first. The first is Rabindranath was a great educationalist. And this is a fact. And we are stating this. So, this is a statement. And obviously, this statement is a factual. There comes the second sentence, what are you learning? This is also a fact, but it's asked with a question. So we may consider this as what? As interrogative sentence. So the first one is assertive and the second was it is uh, obviously this is interrogative. And from there, we may uh, get another sentence. For example, I am learning mood. So here, you'd get what the fact is. So this is how indicative mode speaks of a statement or a question. So there comes the next one that is the imperative mood. And as you know, imperative, yes, let's check it out first. Imperative mode makes a verb sounds as a comment or request. So it's related to comment or request. It also uses the second person as the subject of the sentence and most of the time the subject remains hidden. So here you won't get a subject. How is this? Let's uh, have an example first and you'd understand it clearly. Bring the umbrella here. So it begins with a verb bring and there's no subject. Why? Because the subject is the second person and uh, you may take it as a comment. And what happens? A comment can be produced by the first person only and a comment can be received by the second person only. That's why the subject is always the second person and here you don't need to put the subject you before the sentence. It remains understood. And also the second one, make me a bowl of soup, please. This is obviously a request and a request can be made by a first person and be received by the second person that's why there also the second person the subject you is understood there's another sentence let her take her own decision and here if you follow that let this is the verb and not the take take is not the verb here rather let is the verb so it begins with a verb and without a subject, whereas the subject is obviously the second person. So now we are going to shift to the subjunctive mood or the very essential one. Now what is subjunctive mood? Subjunctive mood indicates the possibility, wishes or hypothetical statements. So three points are given here, possibility, wishes or hypothetical statements. So you'd have to focus on these three qualities of the verb possibility, wishes, and hypothetical statements. It is almost the opposite of the indicative mood. So how is it is the opposite of indicative mood? we we'll discuss them in our examples. So let's proceed further. This mood usually mixes the tense of the verbs and does not follow the common usage of the tense. This is also very much important. It does not follow the common usage of the tense. How, why, we we'll discuss all about them. Just step to the examples and get a detail about this. But before this, we'd have some other discussions to put focus on it. Subjunctive has some different structures 
from the other structures of sentences. So the normal structures of sentences won't be followed yet for the subjunctive mode. So what structure would follow there? We'd learn them in our next slide. Conditionals. Conditionals generally use the subjunctive mode. This is also a very much essential part of our learning of English grammar conditionals and we'd uh, obviously learn very little about conditionals in uh, our next presentation. This presentation would be very much limited only the basic things about conditionals. So the first example, if you change this dress, I'll take you with me. Now if you consider this sentence, you'd get that if you change this dress. So this is a possibility. We have uh, asked, uh, we have told about uh, possibility in our uh, previous slide. So this is a possibility. If you change this dress and this is also a condition, I'll take you with me. So here you'd find that the normal uses of conditional is reflected. The next one is if I wear in your shoes, I would not do it. If I wear, isn't it weary? Yes, if I wear normally, we expect was in its place, but here we are using where. Why? Because this is hypothetical. I can't be in your place, but still I'm considering. So this is a hypothesis. That's why here the normal rules of tense isn't followed. And also you'd get the similar types of sentences here. If they were in America, they could not escape from it. So. If they were in America, that means they are not presently in America. Rather, I'm considering it's a hypothesis. I'm getting a hypothetical statement. But one thing that uh, about construction of these sentences, about the structure. Here, I have used where for I as well as they. So, here you must understand one fact that whether this is a uh, first person or second person or third person, whether it's a singular or plural, that doesn't matter much. We would use where as the verb for these hypothetical conditionals. And the next one, if they had taken the vaccine, they would not have been affected. So here we have shown the use of had and we'd get more of them in our next slides or probably when we go to the next presentation where we would have a detailed discussion of conditionals. So stay glued to this channel. We are going to have a detailed discussion of conditionals in subjunctive mood in some other forms of our presentation. So in conditionals, we are going to discuss about some specific structures, some certain verbs plus the conjunction that requires the next clause to use the subjunctive mood and the clause uses the best form of the verb in it. So here we would have a list of certain verbs and there's the list. So these are the verbs like advise, demand, stipulate, command, suggest, decree, etc. So with these verbs, when we get that as the conjunction, what it requires, we'd get it in our next slide. So follow this. We are here going to discuss about the structure. So that would be the structure of what we have already discussed. Subject plus the verb of the above box. That is the box we have found there, the list of the verbs at any tense. Tense doesn't matter here. And after that, we'd add that. There comes subject. And now the base form of the verb and not any other form. So what is the base form of the verb? Obviously, you must know one thing clearly that most of the time we don't consider the verb as the base form. Rather, we consider it as the present form of the verb. But it's actually not the fact. The fact is that we get the base form of the verb and then we add it to make the present form or the past form or the past participle form. But what is the most important factor here? It's that our base form of the verb is just similar to the present form of the verb. There's the example, he insisted that I stay at home. So insisted, that's from the list. So subject plus the verbs of the above box that is in, insisted, then we get that and the subject I, then the base form of the verb stay. So this is obviously not a verb rather this is the base form of a verb so it's uh, demanding i to stay at home 
so you may say that uh, this is obviously not the verb rather the best form of the verb and that's our rules we have another the office requires that we complete our work timely so that we to complete our work timely the zanados he commanded that he stop smoking now you may check it here i'm not using s he stops smoking that should be the sentence but here i am not using s that means i am using the best form of the verb and the sentence obviously these sentences are not complex sentences rather they are simple sentences then comes i recommend that you wake up early you wake up early so this is also i recommend that you too wake up early so here these are infinitives actually these are bare infinitives we are using for such verbs like insisted requires command recommend so uh, it's better for you to go to the uh, previous slide and write down the verbs and remember them this is the easiest way to remember the rules and use them properly there's a note for you there are some clauses also which require the verb of the next clause to be in base form so there are some other clauses which demands this besides those verbs the first structure it is or was whatever it may be plus past participle form of the verb of the box above box plus that so this if you consider properly is or was plus past is past participle form of the verb that means here we are getting the passive form of those verbs then comes it is or was urgent plus that then comes it is or was necessary plus that then comes it is or was important plus that so now we'd get the example for each and every rules it is or was past participle form of the verb it is important that you invite the prime minister in our wedding so with important then it was necessary that i make offense necessary i make offense it was recommended that you meet the principal so recommended it was recommended this one so this is the passive form of recommend and here we are also using the base form of the verb meet for the others the examples that i make this is also the best form and that you invite this is also the base form of the verbs so thank you for observing it stay glued to the, our channel and obviously we are going to have a detailed discussion of mood and obviously the each and every factor that we must learn about it so stay glued to our channel and if you have not still subscribe to our channel do subscribe this with the bell icon pressed and obviously have all the notifications for we are going to uh, create very interesting videos regarding education and learning in our channel so stay glued to our channel learn more and we are going to meet again with a very important chapter from mood and still then bye bye happy learning